Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. This is a redo of our Sunday morning message because something happened to our camera and we didn't get a record on it. So uh, we, we wanted to get this on record because it's uh, an important message. We're going to talk today about the Great Commission from a mid ax dispensational viewpoint. And we intend to address our topic by asking a series of questions about the Grace Commission. Before I get into it, I want to tell you about these little booklets we have that are free for the asking. If you write to this address above me here and email us your snail mail address, we will send you a copy of this book, Jesus Wasn't Talking to You, by Terrence McLean. Or a copy of Things I Have Been Taught from the Bible That Are Not True. Uh, I just told my wife, you notice this, this is a triangle right here? And it's setting on the point of a triangle? That's on purpose. That's because if you knock, find one weakness in someone's doctrine and knock that out from underneath them, they'll do like I did when I came home and saying, Babe, if they were wrong about this, what else were they wrong about? <laughs> So this little booklet is, uh, has been preached by Pastor Steve also, and it's yours for free if you'll just write the snail mail address here. There is a common tactic used when someone has a viewpoint that is contrary to our viewpoint, and we don't want to address their viewpoint or address their arguments, and it's called the branding. It takes place when uh, you disagree with somebody and you marginalize them by calling them names, making fun of them and their ideas, thereby branding them to the outer edges as extreme or uninformed, even uneducated, and the purpose is to isolate them and make them and their ideas undesirable to others that hear it that are like-minded with us. An example of this branding would be a comment like, we're all dispensational, but some people simply take it too far. Or, you're just a hyper-dispensationalist. Or maybe you might hear, where did you get such an extreme idea? Or, finally, you're just being divisive. See what they've done? They've branded you. The Apostle Paul faced such tactics in his ministry in Acts chapter 17. It's one of my favorite chapters in Acts. They call it the Tale of Two Cities, Thessalonica and Berea. The Thessalonians were pretty coarse. They didn't like what the Apostle Paul was teaching them, and they ran him out of, the, out of the temple. And he wound up in Berea, and the Bible says in Acts chapter 17 that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they checked themselves. That means they felt it well enough inside of them, but they checked themselves and searched the Scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. So, as we enter our discussion, may we encounter, we may encounter viewpoints that we have not considered before. And my prayer is that if we do, we can emulate the Bereans. And I don't think anybody could ask for a more than an honest evaluation of biblical facts with doctrine truly based on rightly divided scripture. And we're going to talk about two programs. And I believe there's agreement that we today live in the dispensation of grace. And we are no longer living in the dispensation of law. I believe also that most Christians are in agreement that what we know about the dispensation of grace we learned from the Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2. Ah, that's a good way to do that. Um, 
I also believe that most Christian fundamentalists would agree that grace and law oppose one another. It's like oil and water. They do not mix. The law is of Moses, and keeping the law speaks to works. Grace is of Christ and speaks to faith. Grace, the Bible says, grace has brought an end to the law for righteousness. John 1.17, Romans 10.4-10, 10, and Galatians 2.21. So, we are talking about two distinctly different programs of God whereby He is and has been or did dispense and deal, deal out His plan of redemption to and for mankind. So, obviously, if God shuts down one program and suspends, supersedes it with another program, it becomes fairly unwise for us, for man, to go back to the old program that God shut down, or for man to tweak God's new program and mix in the programs together. Now, Paul's letter to the Galatians addresses this problem in Galatians 3, 1 through 2. Take a read of that. Now, I think it's important to realize that when this change from law to grace takes place. We could ask, was it at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or was it at the death of the Lord Jesus Christ? Was it at the resurrection? Or was it at Pentecost? Could it have been after Pentecost? Believe me, our view of when this changes or when this happens changes everything. So as we examine the Great Commission, it is extremely important as to which program of God it finds itself under. And when it takes place is very important to our understanding of the Great Commission. So first of all, let's ask the question, what is the Great Commission? <laughs> now I ask this question to point out to you that there is no agreement in Christianity as to this question. For example, did you know that if you type the words Great Commission into your electronic search engine, on your computer, in, or in your electronic Bible concordance, you will come up with zero hits. Zero. That's because there are no scriptural references in your Bible to what we call the Great Commission. I bet you never realized that, did you? There are no scriptural references to the Great Commission. Do you realize what that means? That means the title, Great Commission, is a man-made title. I want you to think about that. This means that the title, Great Commission, falls into the category of the traditions of men. Now, Jesus has something to say about that in Mark 7. Verses 8 through 10, and then verse 13, I'm going to read. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold to the traditions of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things that ye do. And he said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandments of God, that ye may keep your own traditions, thereby making the word of God of none effect through your man-made traditions. Mm -hmm. That's something else. Mm -hmm. Now man's traditions have done a lot to undermine and corrupt the Word of God. And I would venture to say, and, or to guess, that you have never considered this before. 
So let's consider the implications of this. Let's look at another example. In your Bible, between the Testaments, there is a page titled the New Testament. Now this is an error on the part of Bible translators. They are indicating that your New Testament begins at Matthew 1 and verse 1. The problem is, the Bible tells us that in Hebrews 9.16, that where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. The testator is Jesus, and he did not die until the end of each gospel. So despite what the page in your Bible says, this has become a tradition of men. And now we have longtime Christians, good people, Sunday school teachers, and even pastors believing and teaching that the New Testament begins on the first page of the Gospels. And likewise, we have most people believing that the commands of Christ given at the end of each Gospel are what they call the Great Commission. So, now what we call the Great Commission at the end of each Gospel and in the book of Acts, chapter 1, have been taken as the marching orders for the church, the present day church. And they have been taken, the Great Commission has been taken as the last commands of the risen Christ. But the problem is, the commissions are not even in agreement with each other, and they're definitely at odds with the gospel of grace. And this has caused great debate down through the years to great men of God like H.A. Ironsides, I.M. Halderman, Pentagale, Darby, James Gray, and other great Bible teachers as to which was the, their argument with each other was which one of the Great Commission accounts Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Which one was the Kingdom Commission? And which one is the Church Commission? It's kind of amazing to me that 2,000 years after the risen Christ gave those commandments and ascended to heaven, that there is still no agreement between the churches and their pastors as to which one of these commissions is the marching order for the Gentile church. <laughs> Think about that. Now, I personally believe that this is because, or this is from a failure to comprehend the two plans of God and put the Great Commission in its place in Scripture in one of those plans. I believe the difficulty is because men have tried to press the teachings of the dispensation of law into the dispensation of grace. That's oil and water. And this has caused great disagreement among the denominationalists. I want to explore this a little deeper. I want to address the points of condition, contention, the points of contention that are in the Great Commission. So when, when I say to you that the representation of the Great Commission through the Gospel accounts and in the book of Acts are at odds with the Gospel of Grace, this is what I mean. In the Matthew 28, 19, and 20 account, we find legalism. I can hear you. You're saying, what do you mean? That's crazy. Hold on, Brother Mike. Let me show you. It reads, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching him to observe all things whatsoever, meaning all in all, I have commanded you. Now, <clears throat> 
let me ask you, what did Jesus command? Some would say right off the bat, he commanded to go teach. That means get people saved. That's the Great Commission. Well, okay. Did Jesus command anything else? Yeah, he commanded baptism. Okay, I'll, I agree with that. But did Jesus, Jesus said in that passage there that he, we are to observe all things that he commanded. Could there have been something else? You see, if we isolate this verse and this passage, we are ignoring the other instructions of Christ and the other commands that he gave, like keeping the commandments and obeying the priest. What? Here's your Bible reference. Matthew 5, 17 through 19, Matthew 8, 3 through 4, Matthew 23, 1 through 3, and Luke 18, 18 through 20. And I'm going to read that for you. It's the story of the rich young ruler. A certain ruler asked him, Jesus, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Here's a guy that walked up to Jesus. He wanted to be saved. He wanted to go to heaven when he died. How many of you had that happen to you? <laughs> and Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. This guy wants to know how to be saved, and Jesus is telling him to keep the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, and honor thy father and thy mother. And the young man said, All these things have I kept from my youth up. Now then Jesus heard these things, and he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, and follow me. Now when the rich young ruler asked how to receive eternal life, Jesus told him to keep the commandments. Could we say that is legalistic? That's legalism? I think so. <clears throat> Now the next one is in Mark chapter 16, 16 through 18, and in this one we have baptismal regeneration and miraculous signs. I'm going to read it to you. Mark 16, 15 through 18, and he, Jesus, said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues, and they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now this passage is so problematic that most fundamental Baptists avoid it altogether. Or they trip over themselves doing what we call spiritual gymnastics and they say, the Bible should say, he that believeth and is saved shall be baptized. When the plain word of God says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's baptismal regeneration. And this one has always amazed me. The same men who proclaim that the Bible is the very word of God are willing to change what the Bible says to protect one of their doctrinal positions. Isn't that exactly what Jesus said the Pharisees did in Mark 7 and verse 9? <clears throat> then in the Luke 24, 47 passage and the Acts 1, 8 passage, we have the Jerusalem first instructions of what we call the Great Commission. 
and we have more gymnastics being performed. I heard Jerry Falwell say this with my own ears when someone asked him about it. Jerry Falwell said, well, your hometown is your Jerusalem. <laughs> you think that's what Jesus meant? I mean, really? The last time I looked at a map, Jerusalem was not my hometown. Unless I live there, it's not your hometown either. Unless you live there. So, and then finally, in the John 20, 22 through 23 account of the Great Commission, we have the authority to remit sins. And this is claimed by the Roman Catholic Church, and they have enriched themselves by selling indulgences under this Commission Act. <clears throat> so, I ask the question again, what is the Great Commission? I mean, which one do you want to take? Which one do you want to choose? And do you honestly believe that it's God's plan for you to be in the position in you right now, thinking about that? And this brings us to our next question. What was the Great Commission's message, and in what dispensation is it applied to? <clears throat> now, the student of God's Word doesn't have to go very far to realize that Jesus Christ came in fulfillment of prophecy and that He came strictly to the Jewish nation. Your Bible train for this, your verse train, is Luke 1, 31 through 33, Luke 1, 54 through 55, Luke 1, 70 through 74, Acts 3, 25 through 26, Acts 13, 23 through 33, Romans 15 and verse 8, and John 1 and verse 11. I think those verses will prove my point. Now, according to prophecy, the Jews were promised a kingdom, and they were promised a Messiah to set on David's throne. Exodus 19.6, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 17, Psalms 2, Psalm 72, Psalms 89, 35, 37, Isaiah 11, 1 through 10, and Daniel 2.44. I know you couldn't write those down, but you can look up the tape later. <laughs> Now, this is what John the Baptist came preaching. He came preaching, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is also the primary message of Jesus, who came, his first message was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what Jesus taught his disciples to teach and preach also in Matthew 10, 7 and Luke 9, 60 and 62. This message... The kingdom is at hand was exclusive to the Jews. The kingdom was promised to them. And at this time, the Gentiles were not included at all. Matthew 10, 5 through 7, Matthew 15, 22 through 24, and Mark 7, 25 through 27. <clears throat> the reason for this is, as God's chosen nation... Israel was to reach the Gentile nations for God. They were to become a nation of priests. And as a nation of priests, Israel was to reach the Gentiles. Exodus 19.6, Isaiah 61.6, Zechariah 8.23. So when Jesus came, Israel was in a state of apostasy. God had to get them right first. He was calling Israel to repent because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. This little New Testament is at hand. That means it's close. That means all I have to do is pick it up. The kingdom of heaven was right there for Israel. All they had to do was pick it up, and it would have been theirs. <clears throat> but they were in a state of apostasy, and Jesus had to get them right first. So in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 23, we see the first sending of the disciples by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And in essence, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5 through 23 was a practice run of what we call the Great Commission. It was a training run, if you will. And the disciples of the Lord Jesus were only to go to Israel. And they were to go until they compassed all the cities of Israel. And in verse 23, their message was, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were to do miraculous signs. They did not go on deputation before they went, verse 9. They were to expect persecution, verse 16. And it is clear that Christ had the end of the age in mind when he instructed them in verses 22 and 23. So the dispensation of grace as we know it is as a parenthesis in the prophetic timeline is not even in view yet. We understand that after the resurrection and we understand that after the great commission was given there is no indication that the message changed. There is no indication that a cessation of the demonstration of miraculous signs would occur. We are still in the dispensation of law and we're still practicing miracles, signs, and <clears throat> uh, The fulfillment of prophecy. Well, I, I kind of dropped that, didn't I? Anyway, there's no cessation of, of the demonstration of miraculous signs. But however, there was a change as to the provision. In Luke 22, in verse 35 and 36, he said unto them, When I sent you without a purse, <clears throat> that's their wallet, and without script, that's their money. And shoes, did you lack anything? And they said, Nothing. And he said unto them, But now he that hath a purse, he that has a wallet, let him take it. And likewise his script, take your own money. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Boy, you ought to see the commentators trip over this one. <laughs> <clears throat> They, they trip over the buying of the sword and they trip over taking their own money. This is a true story I'm going to tell you. It's about a missionary whose name was Al King. My, my sister had a family reunion in their backyard and the whole Stewart family got together. And uh, Al King came as a guest to our family reunion. And he, he was on his way to Crimea to be a missionary in the Ukraine. And he was, having, he, was a, he was a Baptist, and he was having trouble gaining support because of their interpretation of being the husband of one wife. You see, Al King was divorced, and he couldn't get support. So he was a very successful businessman, Al King took Luke 22, 35 and 36 to heart, and he paid his own way to the mission field. And he was one heck of a missionary. They started a Bible school over there and trained, trained Ukrainians, young Ukrainians, in the ministry to be missionaries to their own people. Al King has passed away, but his two daughters are still serving the Lord over there right now today. So the provision changed. The provision has changed, but the message here in, in, in the Great Commissions that we're studying is still the same. The only difference in the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the only difference in the message is the expansion and the inclusion of the people that hear it. It expands to include all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And that wording, all nations, in Matthew 28, opens the message up to foreign nations. It opens the message up to Gentiles. 
And the Luke account and the Acts account show the intended progression of the message to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, and finally to the uttermost parts of the earth. So in our study of the Great Commission, we see that the Great Commission was set in the dispensation of law and that its message was the gospel of the kingdom. Which brings us to another question. Did this message and the dispensation change after the resurrection? We're seeking to find out when this happened, when the change took place. And this question naturally follows the previous question, partially because we have been taught that the church, the Gentile church, started at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Now this came primarily from C.I. Schofield in the Schofield Reference Bible, which was first printed in 1909. The Schofield Reference Bible is and was a very popular Bible and still is. When I was ordained as a Baptist minister, they gave me a Schofield reference Bible. Now Schofield said in his notes of Leviticus 23 and verse 16, which is the Feast of Pentecost, that this is the antitype and is the descent of the Holy Spirit to form the church at Pentecost in Acts 2, 1 through 4. Schofield then said, in his notes on Hebrews 12, 23, the church composed of the whole number of regenerate persons from Pentecost to the first resurrection united together and to Christ by the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So that's where we got this idea of the church starting in Acts chapter 2. And this belief is held by most fundamental Christians today. I want to ring this out. I want to consider this belief in the emulation of the Berean Christians. And first, I want you to consider that the footnotes in your Schofield Bible are just that. They're footnotes. They're not Scripture. And secondly, I want us to view what actually happened and what was written after the resurrection up to and including the day of Pentecost. And I want to give you some thought points. After the resurrection, the risen Christ revealed himself to his apostles, apostles and disciples in Luke chapter 24, and he taught them for in a in a seminar for 40 days and 40 nights of things pertaining to the kingdom. kingdom. That's right. Thank you. Acts 1, 1 through 3. Now this is an extension of the same thing that Jesus taught and preached here on earth in his earthly ministry. And there is no indication of any change in the program from law to grace after the resurrection up to and including Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> there is no indication of any change in the program yet from law to grace. And so after 40 days of intensive instruction by the risen Lord, I ask you, what was the number one question on the disciples' minds? Now remember, we're looking for a change after the resurrection. Was their question anything pertaining to Jews and Gentiles being of the same body? Romans 10, 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now one would think that as detailed as Christ's instructions must have been in that seminar, there must have been, <clears throat> if, if Christ, in a 40-day seminar, if Christ had taught anything about the Gentiles coming to him, it would provoke a question, don't you think? 
We, we told you in previous lessons how Peter had a problem with Gentiles. God had to tell him three times up on the roof mount. And when he went, <laughs> I, I got that covered here someplace. I'll, 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 get, there. I'll get that to you. <clears throat> anyway, was there question anything to do with the church, the body of Christ? As in Ephesians 1, and 23, Ephesians 5, 23, and Colossians 1, 24. Or was there question anything to do with the revelation of the mystery as recorded in Romans 16.25, Ephesians 3.9 and 6.19? Or was there question anything about the rapture? Surely if he'd have covered these things in this seminar, there would have been questions about it. Don't you agree? Yeah. So there was no change in message or program that we see here yet. Now we learned from previous lessons that these things had been hidden from prophecy and were not revealed until God revealed them the mystery to the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 2.7 and Romans 16.25. <clears throat> Instead, the disciples' questions was, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1.6. Now, as, as believers, are we to believe that the disciples, after having their understanding, open, their understanding opened by the risen Christ in Luke chapter 24 and verse 45, and after setting through a 40-day seminar of schooling by the risen Christ, that they were so carnal as to misunderstand what Christ was teaching them? The disciples, after hearing John the Baptist announce the kingdom, and hearing Christ himself preach the kingdom, and having been instructed to preach the kingdom themselves, and after hearing the risen Lord speak of the kingdom for 40 days and 40 nights, they simply wanted to know, Dear Lord Jesus, is it now? Are you going to give us the kingdom now? That's not an unreasonable question, do you think? That's the only doctrine they knew. Kingdom doctrine. Now the next big thing in your Bible is Acts chapter 2. <laughs> Which brings us to another question. What about the church starting at Pentecost? And I want to consider together what the Scripture says leading up to Acts chapter 2 and what Scripture portrays as sermons, as Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Excuse me for just a moment. After the risen Christ ascended to heaven, the very first thing the eleven did, remember Judas had died by hanging himself and falling they chose a replacement for Judas Iscariot in the person of Matthias. Now I was taught as, as a teenager in, in the Baptist church that this was a mistake when they chose Matthias because they cast lots for him and casting lots is gambling and gambling is not right in Christianity. So they, they made a mistake by choosing Matthias by casting lots. Well. Since I've come to the understanding of mid dispensationalism and studied my Bible a little deeper, I, I learned that this was just nonsense, what I was taught. That you see, according to Scripture, <clears throat> this was done in an accepted way. In Leviticus 16.8 and Joshua 18.10 and Nehemiah 10.34, the ancient Israelites made many decisions by casting lots, and it was approved of God. This was done, <clears throat> and this casting of lots for Matthias was done after the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and under the Holy Spirit's influence in John 20, verses 19 through 22. It wasn't wrong because this action was necessary as the kingdom was coming in, <clears throat> and they were to be 12 disciples to sit on 12 thrones on the earthly kingdom of Christ. 
Matthew 19, 28, and Luke 22, 30. So after Matthias was chosen, the disciples set out to do exactly what Jesus told them to do. And starting in Jerusalem, as they were told, and using the Jewish feast day of Pentecost as an outreach tool, they witnessed of Christ. Now, Pentecost was, a, was a, one of the seven religious feasts that the Jews were required to attend in Leviticus 23, 1 through 44. So that brings us to Peter's message in Acts chapter 2. And the question is, who heard it? Who heard Peter's message? The hearers are plainly listed in Acts chapter 2. Let me read this to you. Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Why were they out of every nation? Because they were required to come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. The nations are listed in verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, and dwellers of Mesopotamia. Now some would say, there's your Gentiles right there. Those are the Gentile nations that they came from and they were in Jerusalem for Pentecost. No. Wrong. <laughs> it's important for you to understand that these were all Jews, not Gentiles. And verse 10 is the key. Verse 10 says they were Jews and proselytes. A proselyte is a Gentile convert to Judaism. <clears throat> and after they're converted to Judaism, they're not called Gentiles, they're called proselytes. <clears throat> so no Gentiles were allowed to a Jewish religious feast. That's what I wanted to read to you. Acts chapter 10 and verse 28 is quite an astounding verse. Uh, Acts chapter 10 and verse 28. And this is Peter as he was being taken to Nor. Uh, Cornelius' house. Cornelius was a Roman soldier, a Gentile. <clears throat> and Peter said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into contact of one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That's what Peter thought of us as Gentiles. He thought we were common and unclean. And God had to show him the opposite. God had to straighten him out. And Paul had to straighten him out later too. <clears throat> so there were no Gentiles allowed to the Jewish religious feast. And Peter's spoken words confirm this. Peter said, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, verse 14, and ye men of Israel, in verse 22. And ye men and brethren, in verse 29. Peter wouldn't call a Gentile his brother. Peter was speaking to Jews in Acts chapter 2, and only Jews. Now if you look in this little green book, you'll find out that this is the first thing I was approached with when someone exposed me to mid-Acts dispensationalism. And the reason that little triangle is sitting on his face is because you find a weak point in, one per in a person's doctrine and knock that out, the whole thing falls because they have no foundation any longer. And that's why I came home telling my wife, babe, if they were wrong about this, what else were they wrong about? So how could the, earth, to the, early, the, the, the church of the Gentiles start in Acts chapter 2 if there were no Gentiles in Acts chapter 2. Secondly, when Peter spoke to these Jewish men in verse 14, it was not a grace message he delivered. It was a reoffering of the kingdom. And Peter reminded them that according to prophecy, the last days were upon them in verse 17. And the day of the Lord, referring to the terrible time of tribulation, was coming. Isaiah 2.12, Isaiah 13.9, Jeremiah 46.10, 4, 
Joel 2, 11 and 31, Zephaniah 1, 18 and 2, 2 3. Peter put it to them. It, it, it was a murder indictment. Peter put it to them. They killed their Messiah in verses 23 and verse 36. And God had raised Jesus from the dead in verses 24. And it was he, Jesus, who was exalted and sitting on the right hand of God in verse 33, and who would soon make his enemies his footstool in verse 35. And Peter told them, the promise of this kingdom is unto you and to your children. And if you'll just repent and accept Christ as your Messiah, the kingdom can come in again. That's what Peter was telling them. It was a call for them to repent and to bat... <laughs> Verse 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. <laughs> People stumble over that. <clears throat> You've got to understand that baptism is a washing and a readying, readying for the nation of priests that was coming. Israel was to become a nation of priests. They needed to be washed. They needed to be cleansed to be a nation of priests. So baptism was legitimate in the dispensation of law for the remission of sins. <clears throat> and Peter encouraged them to save yourselves from this untoward generation. So Acts 2 is a reoffering of the Messiah and his kingdom to Israel. And under con conviction, the men that heard Peter say, what shall we do? And then that's when Peter gave them Acts 2.38. And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now you don't have to be afraid of this verse. I, I, I tried to explain that to you. Just remember that we're still in the dispensation of law and just leave it there in the dispensation of law. This is the kingdom message and a reoffer of the kingdom to the Jews. And the water baptism called for in verse 38 is associated with the kingdom doctrine and the call to priesthood as Israel was to be, Exodus 19.6, a nation of priests. So to sum up these questions, there were no Gentiles in Jerusalem at Pentecost, so it couldn't be the beginning of the church. Acts 2 is not the birthplace of the church, the body of Christ. Peter's message was not a message of grace. Peter's message was a kingdom message, and it was a reoffer of the Messiah and the kingdom to the nation of Israel. And as a nation, they still rejected the Messiah. Well, you're, you're going to sell me. Uh, <clears throat> Pastor Mike, there were 3,000 souls that were saved that day. Yeah, that's true. And the Bible says there were added unto them 3,000 souls. But that doesn't mean they were added to the church, the body of Christ. They were added to the kingdom church as the dispensation of grace was not even in existence yet. Therefore, Acts 2 cannot be the start of the dispensation of grace. The dispensation of grace was given to the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 3, 2. And Paul had not even been saved yet. Now, this is where I stopped. Sunday morning, right here. And this is where I'm going to wind it up, and I'll bring you part two next week. <clears throat>